This is the Talking About the Hoosiers podcast, presented by HoosierIllustrated.com. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Talking About the Hoosiers podcast, presented by HoosierIllustrated.com. I'm joined by Kyler Staley, John Alden. I'm Drew Rosenberg. Guys, how you doing? Football season right around the corner. Doing doing good. It's good to be back on uh, Talking About the Hoosiers podcast. You know, I'm excited to get this thing ramped back up, you know, as the season's approaching. Um, yeah, talk some football. Um, preview the season and everything and go beyond just IU football, you know, preview, you know, the Heisman and, you know, um, the national champion and all that stuff. But football season's right around the corner. Next thing you know, it's going to be basketball season. So things are getting busy at whosrealestrated.com. Yeah, I'm excited too. A little crossover here with a little in yeah. touch with Indiana sports mixed in with talking about the Hoosiers. I'm glad to be a part of, you know, the Hoosier Illustrated staff now and get to do these types of things with you guys and your yeah, football season. I've been fiending for it for a while now, yeah. and uh, I'm glad we're only a couple weeks away at this point. I feel like every time Kurt Signetti opens up his mouth, I'm like, yes, I want IU football back on the field. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for the Kurt Signetti era of, I mean, IU football. That that yeah. that dude that dude is a quote machine, and he makes me want to run through a brick wall. It is a uh, it's certainly something. So he he's got he he's makes got you want to take make. up smoking. I've never smoked in my life, but <laughs> oh, yeah. the whole the whole cigarette memes that come out that come about from him, I may I may sneak in a cigarette or two this year for Indiana football. <laughs> is, yeah. is, is that is that a topic right now? Is that oh, Coach, Coach Sig? Coach, Coach Sig makes smoking cool. So that, I mean, that's definitely something we got to start. With. You know what? As as a reporter, I'm going to get to the bottom of that story. Um, this out throughout this whole year. So, um, does does Kurt Signetti make smoking cool? Is he making? Is he bringing smoking cigs back? That's the question. He might. I think we're going to see a lot more cigarettes smoked in Memorial Stadium than we ever have now, <laughs> next season. Oh, definitely. Well, let's uh, jump right in. Um, so we're just going to preview predictions for what we kind of expect for IU football. That's just the way, um, I guess, the world of uh, we live in at this point. So I'm going to start with the offensive MVP. A lot of big additions, Elijah Serrett, uh, Curtis Rourke, an entirely new running back room. Kyler, who do you think is going to be the uh, MVP of the offense for Indiana football next year? Right. You said it. it's it's definitely different. Um, you know, a lot of new faces and uh, what we saw, you know, with Tom Allen last year, Kurt Sinetti brought in a lot of guys, um, a lot of key transfer additions. Um, with that, they also brought back a couple of stud returners as well. You look at Donovan McCauley, Mark Cooper Jr. But when I'm thinking about the offensive MVP and there's probably a different route you'd go to, my it, it's really hard for me to pick one or the other right now. So I've got two, so I'm kind of cheating, got a little cop out here, but I'm going to go with <laughs> wide receivers, Donovan McCauley, and then Elijah Serrett. Um, you know, McCauley comes back after a breakout season last year with IU, you know, entered the transfer portal, probably could have went to a really big program, if we're being honest with you. He was probably one of the hottest, you know, um, wide receiver transfer targets out there, but elected to come back, um, play for Signetti. He brings back 48 receptions, 640-something yards, um, and I think he had about six touchdowns last year, if I can remember looking at his stats correctly. Um, playmaker, real stud, a guy that you just throw the ball up and he's going to make a play. I think he's got a lot of legit NFL potential. And then with Elijah Serrett, um, one of the – I mean, you could probably make an argument. He's probably the biggest transfer addition to this Indiana team um, this offseason. Came from JMU with Signetti. Um, probably will be the most targeted wide receiver, I think, out of this group. Um, you know, Sarah's really comfortable with Signetti's offense. He knows what to bring in that. Um, caught 82 passes last year, um, nine touchdowns. And he was one of the highest rated wide receivers in the transfer portal as well. So a lot of hype with him. So for me, kind of cheating here, but I'm going to go with both McCauley and Sarah as my uh, my MVPs. I'll be a little more definitive here. I'm just going to stick with Donovan McCauley. And I think his resume speaks for himself. You kind of laid out all of the kind of, ac not even accolades, but just kind of what he's done over his course, his career at Indiana, making the, tran the transition from quarterback to wide receiver and thriving. And I do think if Indiana is going to have a really good first year under Kurt Signetti, I do think you're going to see a lot of touchdown grabs from Donovan McCulley, Curtis Rourke to McCulley, or whoever the quarterback ends up being. I'm sure it's going to end up being Rourke as all things kind of, are indicated that way so far. But um, if Indiana is going to have the type of year that fans kind of hope uh, in Kurt Signetti's inaugural season with the Hoosiers, you're going to see a lot of yards and a lot of touchdowns from Donovan McCulley. I'm going a little bit uh, of a different direction, Kyle. I kind of told you I was going a little outside the box for this one, but I'm going to go Carter Smith at left tackle. I think quietly he was one of the biggest um, 
the biggest plays of the offseason. When he entered the portal, it would have been a massive loss him coming back. I mean, he's 6'5", 308, redshirt sophomore. He's going to be an anchor of the O-line. And especially after the news that broke just last night of Nick Kidwell is going to miss the entire season, the O-line play is going to be critical for Indiana. It's been a problem. It's been something that has been kind of an issue over the past few years. So for Indiana and Kurt Signetti, if they want to establish the passing game, the O-line is going to have to be good. And Carter Smith is going to be a really, really big factor for the success of the O-line. So, you know, it's kind of sticking with the offensive line. That, by the way, that's a great pick. I mean, that's a very outside-the-box pick, Drew. I'm going to give you major props for that one. Um, with the O-line, <laughs> uh, my, uh, my kind of question to both of you guys, I'm curious to hear both of your answers. Um, what do we think about the offensive line this year? Does it look solid? I know they had that big loss, obviously. Um, does it look serviceable this year? Do you think the Indiana fans, the staff, do you think that they should feel comfortable with this offensive line? John, I'll defer to you. I'll let you uh, jump in first. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, obviously, big loss with Nick Kidwell. The news that I believe came out yesterday or whenever it was, yeah. may have been today. Um, losing him is obviously going to hurt, but I do think a big factor that's going to help this Indiana offensive line is the fact that Bob Bostad was retained for the, for the staff for Kurt Signetti. And, so, and plus, you bring guys back. You mentioned Carter Smith, and there's a few other guys. I know you lost some as well, but I do believe that already being under Bostad's system and you're kind of bringing in some more talent, hopefully um, maybe have a better head on their shoulders, if you will, with Kurt Signetti, just kind of the attitude that he brings. I think you'll see an improved offensive line. you, you got to stay healthy. If you keep losing guys like Nick Kidwell, you're going to have some problems. Yeah. Um, but I think, I mean, one loss, you're, you're going to have injuries. It doesn't matter what position it is. And if you don't have at least a little bit of depth, you're going to be in trouble no matter what program you are. So I think the offensive line will take a step forward. How big a step, you know, that remains to be seen, but I think we'll see some improvement. Yeah, and I think you talk about some of the additions. Nick Kidwell was one of them, a big loss losing him, but Trey Weedig from Wisconsin, a guy Bob Ostad has a lot of famili familiarity with, recruited him out of a high school. Didn't really kind of find a consistent role there, but could be a really big piece on the right side, especially now losing Kidwell. Tyler Stevens, another addition, and then Mike Cadet coming back. That's a big addition for Indiana on that O-line. And behind Kidwell, I believe it's Max Williams who's going to slot, sl um, slot in at right guard, uh, the sophomore. He's a guy I do think could be effective. I wasn't expecting him to, I guess, step into a role until after Kidwell and Stevens left. So now kind of getting thrown into the fire a little bit. So you get to kind of see what he's made of. But moving over to the defensive side of the ball, John, who do you think is going to be the uh, defensive MVP of Indiana? I'm taking Aiden Fisher, and I don't know if there's really a lot of other guys that I would I would put in this category. I mean, anybody could could win it. You never have a season that you won't, don't expect. But from what we've seen, or really just heard, I guess, from the talk of Aiden Fisher, the way that he kind of carries himself and how he's already been kind of known as this leader in the locker room, and to be a transfer from James Madison as well, you can kind of tell that he's already commanding or taking command of that entire defensive unit. And, I mean, that doesn't necessarily speak to numbers for sure, but um, I think that will translate to how the defense plays overall, and I think he's going to end up being not only the biggest leader on the defense, but maybe even the biggest leader on this team as a whole. John John, kind of taking my thunder here. I'm also going to go Aiden Fisher. Um, I was glad I got to go first with that one because I was like, there's not going to be many other options. I feel. Yeah, nothing, I, nothing against the defense, but yeah. there's, there's a clear favorite, I feel like, on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he he's the quarterback of the defense, in my opinion, the way I look at him. And you you nailed it, John, when, you know, at Big Ten Media Days, that was really the first time that I got to actually hear him talk um, and whatnot. And just, yeah, the way that he carries himself, he, he carries himself like a leader. That's what he is. And for him to come into the program, being a transfer, really had no ties with the Indiana program at all. He's already came in, and he feels like he's been a part of this program for a long time. He's just really adapted really well. Um, and he was definitely the type of guy that Signetti really needed to bring just to bring Signetti's culture in, um, you know, from a player standpoint. But, I mean, this guy's a tackling machine from what you can see back at JMU. Um, 108 tackle season. Um, I think he had – I think he averaged six tackles a game, somewhere around there. But, I mean, if you watch the film on him, and I've only seen a few clips, and the guy plays like a dog. And he's just a smart player. Um, he's the type of guy that you want on a defensive unit. Um Maybe could have went with someone like, a, I don't know, Pons, you know, in the secondary or whatever. Yeah. But um, for me, it's, it's the quarterback of the defense. I think he's going to be a stud all season long. Yeah, I also uh, said Aiden Fisher, so going last, you know, makes it 
<laughs> makes it seem like <laughs> copying you guys. I promise I'm not. I but I did pull a quote from after the spring game from Signetti. I think Brian he said after the game, I think Brian Haynes sleeps a lot better at night with him. He's like a quarterback of the defense, knows it inside and out, really studies, really respected by his teammates, helps get everyone lined up. So making progress, good football player. And Signetti Signetti's someone who's kind of been very like holds back on praising individual players. So when he's saying that about a guy, about a guy you know he's doing something right. And I do want to give a shout to D'Angelo Pons. You mentioned him. He was a freshman All-American at JMU. There's a reason for that. He is a stud. 13 pass breakups last year, two interceptions, 51 tackles. He is very likely going to slot in at the number one corner. I don't expect him to be a shutdown corner right away just because making that adjustment from James Mass into the Big Ten. But moving forward, he's going to be a very critical part of that defense. Uh, moving on, uh, breakout players. Kyler, I'm going to start with you. Hopefully we don't all have the same answer, but it's uh, very possible based on the last one. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of guys I think you could actually go with on here, but I'm going to go with my guy, my Lawrence North guy. I'm going to go with Omar Cooper Jr., another okay. wide receiver. I'm very, very high on this wide receiver unit in case you haven't uh, caught on by now. But Omar Cooper Jr., um, 18 passes last year. Um, caught 267 yards, two touchdowns. Um, he was actually, I, I didn't know this until looking in, he was second on the team in yards per catch, um, yeah. which was kind of great last year. And, you know, obviously the uh, the wide receiver core, I mean, there was a lot of potential last year with that team, he, a lot of breakout um, in that. You know, obviously we talked about Donald McCauley broke out, but um, Omar Cooper showed some really good signs. I thought he made a lot of great plays last season um, and whatnot. And I think this year, I think he's going to really benefit from Macaulay and Sarah being the first two options on that team. And I think the secondary, whoever's covering him, I think they're going to lose him a bunch of times. And I think he's going to be a playmaker. I, I really do. And I think he's going to make a lot of big plays for this Indiana team. Um, I, I think Signetti's offense, I think they're going to get creative in the way that they use him as well um, because he's a sneaky stud, man. He really is. And he's got a lot of breakout potential um on this team so and i just like his game I, I really do i just love how the way he um you know brings himself on the field and whatnot so omar cooper jr another wide receiver i'm gonna go with him as the breakout player of the year for me I i'm actually going to the running backs room so and i know this may this is to me it's more so newcomer of the year because a lot of the running backs if you look at who's on this roster they're older guys but they're all transfers this entire running back room is either somebody from a different school or somebody that's an incoming freshman in kobe martin but i think you're going to see somebody whether it be justice ellison tyson lawton Kalon Black, Solomon Van Horse, literally any of them. This is going to be a running back by committee type of room, but it wouldn't surprise me if one of those guys ends up kind of, you know, just leading the pack, being your primary guy you go to whenever you're running the ball. Um, if I'm going to pick one, I think I'm going to go with Tyson Lawton. I believe he had a really good spring game, so that's kind of what I'm basing it off of. And, and I'm sure Kurt Signetti, being familiar with his game at James Madison, it wouldn't surprise me if, if he leans heavily on him, especially at first. I think I like that answer a lot. I think, I mean, I agree. It's going to be, I expect it to be a committee. I think another guy, Elijah Green, could slot in there and you could see a lot of stuff at the goal line for him. Kyler, I also had Omar Cooper. I think a big <laughs> there we part. go. I think the big play potential with him is there. I mean, we've seen him do it in games. He's seven for 100, uh, 101 yards against Indiana State, had a good game against Penn State, three catches, 52, and a touchdown. You mentioned the yards per catch, 14.8. I don't expect him to start the year as the third receiver. I think it's likely just going to be either Miles Price or Miles Cross, just because those guys both have more experience. But by the end of the year, don't be surprised if Omar Cooper slides in and is that number three, because with so much um, so much experience in this receiver room, you have so many seniors. Very likely, the 2025 season, it's going to be Elijah Serrett and Omar Cooper Jr. as the one and two. And I think Signetti kind of sees that, and he's going to give Cooper Jr. a lot more opportunities to become more consistent and become more of a threat on the offense than he has been over the last year. So, obviously, real quick before we move on, obviously, I, I think it's safe to say that this one uh, – I can't talk – wide receiver room is probably the strength of this Indiana offense. Yeah. Um, I think we agree on that. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is like, you know, when you look at the depth of this wide receiver room – one guy that we want to see a little bit more on the field is EJ Williams, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, my question is, if he's healthy going in, where does he factor in all this? Will he be the third option, you know, to start off the season if he's healthy? Or well, what do you guys think? While we're on receivers, I, 
outside of who you all were mentioning, I was going to break it and talk about Miles Cross. That's yeah. somebody that Curtis Rourke is very familiar throwing mm-hmm. to back when he was at Ohio. So he's another candidate for, especially if we're talking about the passing game in particular, somebody who may end up getting a little, a few more receptions than maybe one might anticipate mm-hmm. just because of his familiarity and chemistry with, uh, with Curtis Rourke. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really interesting. I think it's a good problem to have for Indiana. I mean, you have six, seven, eight guys even. If you go to Keyshawn Williams and Anderson Kobe, another two seniors, you have so many guys in that wide receiver room, so it creates so much competition. And that's something Signetti's kind of preached all offseason about competition at every position room. So it's a good problem to have, but it's one of those things with so many seniors. How do guys fit in? Like an EJ Williams who's showed so much talent and promise, but it just can't stay on the field. So interesting. It's going to be an interesting dynamic moving forward into yeah. the season, especially as these scrimmages. I know first scrimmage of last weekend, and as the scrimmages continue to happen, who kind of establishes themselves as the guys? Because really, what it seems like from the outside looking in, it seems like McCauley and Sarah are kind of the locks to start at the number one and number two, and then after that, it's really anyone could be three through eight. So. Going to be something. One more thing before we move on, though, because you, you all have been saying his name enough to where I've just got to ask the question. I've always been saying Elijah Surratt. I'm assuming I'm incorrect on this. Do we know for sure it's Sarat? <laughs> you know what? You, you can be correct. I mean, I've got a Southern Indiana okay. accent. You, you're from Kentucky, so we both we all could be wrong. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm just not curious. A, yeah. You all would be more in tune than I would. At least Kyler, <laughs> you might be. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's Sarah. I want to say it is. I've heard Signetti say it, and now that you've like asked, I'm pizza like, bet. Now, Whenever now we hear him announced the- on on BTN or whatever the first time, or, or even in the stadium, pizza bet right now. <laughs> so, sounds good. I'm in. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Well, it's, it's you know moving to the basketball side. Obviously, a lot of people still call Malik Renew Malik Renew. So uh, Reno, yeah, or Reno, yeah. yeah. French it's accent. Khalil, Khalil, Khalil versus no. Khalil. Khalil is versus it Khalil? Khalil? I don't know if I ever Khalil. got it correct. It's Khalil. It's Khalil. Yeah, I never said that is, correct. Yeah, so I always say Khalil. I started with Khalil, then got corrected, and then corrected the other way, and then heard him say it. He said Khalil. I asked him there about it at um, the media day last year. So there you go. Per um, sources. Per sources. <laughs> Who's your illustrator? Direct source. <laughs> yeah, direct source. <laughs> So uh, moving on, I guess year one for Kurt Signetti, he's kind of talked about no self-imposed limitations. What do you guys see, I'm going to start with you, John, is a successful season in year one for Indiana? A successful season in year one for Kurt Signetti. I've talked about this a few different times on In Touch with Indiana Sports just because it really depends on who you ask. And I'll just go with, I guess, my expectation. When you hear Kurt Signetti talk and he says things like it's, it's BS to be six and six, and that kind of be success at Indiana. And I don't think any program, even if you are one like Indiana, where you haven't been very successful over the years, you don't want six and six to be the standard. But here's the thing. In year one, when you're a program that's not used to being in bowl games very often, and you kind of just want to take that stepping stone forward, I do think at the bare minimum, Signetti and his staff need to find a way to at least get to bowl eligibility in year one yeah. because you got to back up the talk a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I know people, they don't have to win the Big Ten title the way that Signetti tends to suggest could happen. And I'm not saying it can't. I just don't expect it to. Mm-hmm. But I think six and six kind of being the floor. But I think with the favorable schedule, if things go your way, I think you could even find them at a seven and five, maybe even eight and four, realistically. Yeah. Yep, and I'm going to once again echo John. Um, bowl game. That is uh yeah. that's that's my answer for that one. So John mentioned it um really well, actually. a uh, lot of talk with Signetti, right? Um just came in, he's just instilled confidence into this program. Um, I think with any other coach, you know, you look at the past years of Tom Allen, if any other coach were to come in, I think Indiana fans would be like, Okay, maybe five wins, that'd be great to have, maybe six and six, you know, that'd be pretty solid, but no. Um, you kind of got to put all this weight on Signetti right now, and he's got to back up the talk in a lot of ways. So, um, I mean, he's got Indi- you, he's got Hoosier Nation thinking that this Indiana team can compete in the Big Ten. He really does, just the way that he talks. Um, that could be a great thing. That could be a bad thing. Who knows? We're going to find out, you know, as the season goes on. But to me, a successful season, he's laid the groundwork for it. It's a bowl game, at least. Um, you got to figure out a way to get it. I mean, and we'll get a little bit more into the schedule here in a little bit, I'm sure. But, um, yeah. Obviously, you know, the schedule is pretty favorable for this Indiana team. So he's got to back up the talk. I'm going bowl game if, if we want to talk about what a successful season is. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think bowl game is kind of what should be, not maybe not the goal for the season, but if a successful season would be a bowl, like if you get to a bowl game, just based on the schedule, it's very doable. The only way I could say maybe it's a success if Indiana doesn't win, uh, get to a bowl game is if you win five games, take care of the three um, non-conference games, and then you also take down Purdue, get the old Oak and Buck and back, and then beat Michigan State and get the old Brass spoon. If you beat win both rivalry games and you win five games in your first year with Indiana after they've lost to Purdue for so many years in a row, it feels like, I think that would be maybe not a full success, but something to be like, all right, we can build off that. Because, I mean, a lot of these new guys are already talking about the old Oak and Bucky game. Aiden Fisher and Big Ten Media Day made a big deal talking about how he wants to get it back. He hasn't played a single down of football for Indiana <laughs> football, and he's all in on the rivalry. I know fans love that. And I'll say this, too. Uh, it, 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 even though I, I get what you're saying, Drew, it would be disappointing if you've looked at Kurt Signetti's record. He's never had a losing record. So yeah. for him to go 5-7 and seven and finally kind of take that gash of not having a winning season there would be some disappointment to that yeah. but if there is some promise on what you see on the field and more positive than negative and you do happen to miss bowl eligibility yeah fans will be upset i mean i'll be upset for sure yeah but it is if there's if there's something to build off of i get it i do think there is a path forward if if, if they and one last thing i'm going to say here if they somehow do go five and seven and you know the craziest thing happens and signetti has a losing season for him to kind of back up and you know keep that hope within the Indiana fan base, he's got to be competitive in all seven of those, of those losses. Yes. Really mm -hmm. um, can't be getting blown out. You know, you can't lose any of the non-conference teams. Yeah. Um, it, they should absolutely blow those teams out. They really got to take care of business, you know, do something that Tom Allen really struggled with last year um, for the most part. But, you know, if, if he's going to be five and seven, got to back it up with the competitive football at the end. You, you just got to have something to build off of mm -hmm. going into hit year two with Signetti. And the way the schedule opens up, I mean, you have a lot of very winnable games. You don't play Oregon. Um, Michigan and Ohio State are really the two toughest games. You have Washington in a year with a new coach. UCLA, new coach. Maryland doesn't have Tiger by low anymore. Like, there is a lot of games on that schedule that in the past you would shock up as being like, okay, they're probably going to lose that. And you're like, okay, that could be interesting. So there's no reason this Indiana team can't win six, seven, or even eight games next season. With that, though, speaking of the schedule, John, I want to ask you, what is what game on the schedule do you, are you kind of circling and it's like this is the most critical game of the season? Yeah, and I hope I'm not stealing Kyler's answer on this one because I do have kind of two ways to look at this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the biggest glaring uh, obstacle when it comes to this can kind of be a season-defining game. It's that week three at UCLA. Mm -hmm. UCLA is – a team, obviously, they're from the West Coast, and you're going on the road, and that's going to be a challenge in and of itself. But they're kind of in a weird situation where they lost their coach, Chip Kelly, in the random point in the offseason. And Deshaun Foster kind of presented himself at media days like he's a little, I don't know if nervous is the right word. Maybe he's just yeah. not good behind a microphone. But he didn't exactly you know, show that he was very confident necessarily himself or his team or whatever. Um, but I do think – that's a very winnable game. UCLA doesn't have a lot of fans either that come to their football games, and I know Indiana's in that boat as well. And I don't think it's nearly as bad. Any of those West Coast teams, say for uh, or at least the California teams, say for maybe USC, they struggle to bring in fans the way that a lot of teams in the Southeast and the Midwest do. So mm -hmm. I think if Indiana's 2-0 and and looking good and you can steal that road game at UCLA – I mean, the rest of the the next few games set up for Indiana very nicely with Charlotte, Maryland, and Northwestern rounding out the first half mm -hmm. of your schedule. Your entire first half of the schedule at that point becomes winnable. And I'm not saying that they're going to go 6-0, and but all of them are winnable games. And I'm, so that's just kind of where I'm at with where the team could go if they can get that win at UCLA. <laughs> Once again, John, taking my answer. But I'm going to go with a different – I'm going to go a little different route here, but – Without question, I think the answer is UCLA, obviously, right there. Um, John nailed it, so I won't even repeat you know, what he said. So <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but I do want to bring up the questions. You know, it is clear cut, I think, that UCLA is the most important, you know, game of the season for Indiana. But if you realistically want to look at, you know, the schedule or whatnot, you could even make an argument that FIU is the most important game, the first game of the Signetti season. You could look at, I don't know, the, the homecoming game versus Nebraska – um, Maryland, you know, got a team that, you know, you're familiar with in the Big Ten. You could even look at the Purdue game. 
um, as being, you know, super important as well. There's a lot of ways that you can look at this schedule, but the bottom line is this, the schedule is really good for Indiana for a first year head coach um, in, in the big 10 conference, I should say um, for, for him to have a schedule like this with a new team, I, I think that's really good. And obviously you've got kind of the backbreaker, you know, towards the end of the season with Michigan and Ohio state back to back. That is what it is at that point, you know, but um, schedule is really favorable for Indiana, but there's a lot of important games this year. Without question, the answer is UCLA. Um, I think everyone's going to say that, but yeah. um, you could make an argument for a few others on the schedule. But yeah, I do, I do I, want to mention – oh, go ahead, Drew. You, I don't mean oh, to step on your toes. Oh, you're good. I was going to say I also had UCLA, but I was going to bring up a couple other games when you look at the schedule. I think the UCLA game, I'm going to group three into that, the UCLA Northwestern Maryland. If you look at Indiana's schedule after that stretch, those first six games, you really think like if they want to reach those goals when we're talking seven, maybe eight wins, you got to take at least two of those three. Because if you yeah. go into that that final six games, five and one, you're going um, Nebraska, Washington, Michigan, Ohio State, four really tough teams against tough, uh, tough games against teams that could be very good and then Purdue and Michigan State. So I feel like of those first six, you got to win at least four probably five if we're going to see them win seven, eight games. And I just wanted to give a shout out to that Indiana Northwestern game because I saw a graphic about how that is one of the most expensive tickets to a game in college I football. I saw that too. That's so weird. It's Unbelievable. weird. But playing on is that it because of the though? Indiana alum in Chicago and, you know, just yep. the, the novelty then, of playing on the in that weird stadium, the new – not even new, the yeah. temporary stadium. I mean, I that's the thing. I mean, that's I definitely that's the thing. There's a, there's a lot of alumni in Chicago. I mean, yeah. I think that's probably the alumni capital um, okay. of the nation. So um, I think it's going to I think that's going to be a really expensive ticket, no matter who comes into town yeah. this year for the Northwestern, uh, you know, Wildcats. Yeah, I saw the graphic. I think it was um, college football report on Twitter. It was two hundred seventy five dollars. I think it's just a mix of the Indiana fan base wants to see Signetti and what it's all about, in addition to a smaller stadium. But it's. It's really funny when you're looking at the games and you see Texas, Michigan, Ohio State, Texas, Texas A&M, all these games that are, you know, premier programs, and you, you have Indiana Northwestern just in the middle. I love it. I love it. That's some Big Ten football, baby. John, what were you saying again? Sorry about that. Uh, I just wanted to you, – Ty, Kyler was mentioning the FIU stuff, and that was kind of what I was going to go to if, yeah. if Kyler was to answer the question first because I do think there is something to say about – if Signetti comes out and faces FIU at home, you're going to have a crowd. You're going to have people wanting to see some fireworks after all the talk has been, you've been listening to it this off season and people, there are people with expectations for this year, whether, whether fans want to admit it or not, there's a sector of the fan base that's, that's expecting in some way, shape or form for Signetti to kind of, I don't want to say do the impossible, but really kind of defy expectations. Yeah. And if Signetti comes out and lights up FIU and wins something like, I don't know, 56 to 10, just throwing that out there. If he mm -hmm. does something like that, that opens up, I don't want to say opens the floodgates because it's still FIU, but I mean, you're pounding the spread. I believe the spread right now is minus 21 for Indiana, depending on who you mm -hmm. look at. And if you're taking care of business that easily in game one, that'll definitely at least get people fired up for what may be coming the rest yeah. of the year. No, I like that. It's I think that game, especially the first two games of the year, you blow out Western Illinois too. Those are tone setting games. If you can blow those teams out and do what you're supposed to do, it could set the tone for those that UCLA game moving forward. Yeah. I mean, you look at the team last year, they had uh, Indiana State, which they beat, they beat comfortably and it wasn't, you know, as pretty as it probably should have been. And then you go to Akron a game Indiana should have lost, a missed chip shot field goal. I was standing in the end zone behind the goalpost for that. That was still to this day one of the most ridiculous things I think I've ever seen in my life. I was but, at an Avenged Sevenfold concert the night of the Akron game, and I'm glad that I didn't yeah. care at all what was going on at the during the Indiana game because I would have been pissed. I was watching it at a wedding in California. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> shout, I, shout out my boy Eric. I was watching the game at your wedding. So. <laughs> Uh, me and a couple other reporters saw it. We're thinking game's over. Um, we're in the press box. I'm like, all right, we need to get down. Usually, you know, when the game's kind of over and they're about to, like, run the clock, you, like, start to walk down and move down into the press area for the uh, post game. So we're waiting on the elevator, finally get off the elevator, thinking the game's over. We hear the crowd go silent. We're like, what just happened? Akron scored a 70-yard touchdown tie ball game. And we're like, what is going on right now? This game was over not even 30 seconds ago. 
and as you guys probably remember, that game was all-out chaos, two-point conversions, missed field goals, just one of the craziest games I've ever been to, I think. And the fact that it was Akron, Indiana is just ridiculous, to say the least. But I guess we've talked so much about the schedule. Our, what we see as a successful season, Kyler, I'm going to start with you. What, do you. what are your final record predictions for Indiana? Am, am I crazy to say eight and four? Does that seem you're not? Crazy? You're not because that's what I'm oh. thinking. That's what, all right. Well, um, the funny thing is, uh, oh, that, that actually kind of bums me out because I'm usually the optimistic one. As Drew, yeah, you all, yeah, um, you you're know, what? I'm gonna resident. say nine and three. No, I'm just kidding. I'm the resident <laughs> pessimist on this podcast. <laughs> oh, man. I ain't gonna go that far, but going eight and four, we'll go ahead and talk about the losses. They're gonna lose to Michigan, we're gonna lose to Ohio State. I mean, that's just how it is. Indiana fans, you know, someone might be a little bit mad with me saying that, but even though Coach Signetti did call them out, um, I think they're going to be wanting blood after that. So they're going to lose to those two. Um, and then I think that they lose the other two games that they lose. I think it's of either, you know, Washington, Maryland, Nebraska, Michigan State, or Northwestern. Those five teams, um, I think Michigan State is going to be a little bit better this year than what people are thinking. Um, it seems like Indiana kind of struggles with Maryland um, the last few times that I can remember. Yeah. Washington, you know, I think they're going to be solid. And then Nebraska, I think they're going to be much better. than Northwestern, you just don't know with them. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with Aiden Ford this, this, this time around. I, I, I mean, it may be crazy to think. I know John's thinking the same thing, but um, I think it's very doable for this team, especially with the track record that uh, Signetti has. Yeah, and I don't mean it for it to sound homerish because I know we're fans here and we're also we, – we try to be objective, and I think we are for the most part, hopefully. But I do th – I, I wholly believe they're going to be UCLA on the road. And, again, maybe that's just the the excitement of the season coming upon me. Maybe they kind of – maybe they let me down and against FIU and Western Illinois and don't look as good as I maybe expect them to be, and maybe that UCLA game is a bit more of a challenge. But as of right now, I think they win that UCLA game – I think they'll win at least one of the two between Maryland and Northwestern. I think they'll get one of the two between Nebraska and Washington. And I think they're going to go into Michigan State and get that old brass platoon back. I think that gets me up to eight. And I'm also including them winning the old Oaken bucket. And uh, if that equates up to eight, I think that does. Because that would include losses to one of the two between Maryland and Northwestern, one of the two between Nebraska and Washington, and then, of course, Michigan and Ohio State. So, yeah, that checks out. For being eight and four so that's where i'm at right now obviously as the season progresses i will more than likely change my mind on that but if as it stands coach signetti you you've done your job you've gotten people expecting you to defy the odds with indiana football and uh you know that's we'll see right we'll see that's where we're at drew go ahead and go ahead and tell us that they're only going to win four games this year go ahead Please. and the, yeah. the, the, put a little yeah. reality yeah. into my yeah, I'm not, yeah. i I've actually been kind of the other way this year. I've, I mean, I have kind of a positive outlook. I've been in between the six and eight game range for Indiana. I think we, I think we all agree. Uh, Michigan, Ohio State, those are very likely going to be two losses. I think Indiana probably is going to lose to Washington as well. And then I'm kind of this a couple toss up games I'm looking at a Nebraska game. I think Indiana probably drops one between UCLA, Maryland, Northwestern. So I'm going to go at seven and five. I think Indiana, if they start five and one. That's a really good start, but then you have Nebraska, which I think I think it's Nebraska is going to be a lot better than people think. I think Dylan Rayola is I think he's going to establish himself as one of the best quarterbacks in college football moving forward. I just I really believe in the talent there, and Matt Rule. I mean, we've seen it everywhere he's gone at the college level. He's shown he can turn programs around. He turned a Baylor program around that was riddled with uh, scandal and allegations and. A Nebraska program, I think it's a lot easier of a job to turn around. So I think Nebraska is going to be a lot better than people kind of think right now. So I think when you look at that, I, I think it's seven and five. But if, as I mean, we mentioned, if they come out of the gate, don't really dominate FIU or Western Illinois like we're hoping and expect them to, then I could easily flip back to five and seven, six and six. But I, <laughs> right now, right now in this moment, I'm sticking at seven and five. I think the important thing is, and just continue on this schedule talk, I think the most important thing is that first half of the schedule, yeah. take care of business. Just really take care of business. And then, honestly, you know, the last half of the schedule, you're playing with house money in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, that's when you expect to be playing your best football either way. So just take care of business. You know, those first four games, you get those four wins right there. Then you're only two away, obviously, from bowl eligibility. I think the big thing for this Indiana team, I think that would really just hype up Hoosier Nation, is if they were able to get the six wins very early in the season. Um, 
And then obviously, you know, whatever happens after that goes from there. So um, take care of business in the first half of the schedule. And then I think you can get up to eight wins this year. I've got to say one more thing too. And Matt, and this is just theorizing, right? Imagine a scenario where Indiana is six and zero going into the Nebraska game right mm-hmm. after your bye week, right? Because they do have a bye week sandwich right in the middle. That's also homecoming weekend and Hoosier yeah. hysteria weekend. Yeah. That could be one of the biggest weekends in not only football turnout, but just turnout in general for IU basketball, football, that all that stuff put together in one weekend. It could be one of the biggest weekends in you know in town for the entire season, yeah. you know, the athletic season, if, if, if for what I'm trying to say. A lot, yeah. lot, lot bigger weekend than it was last year where they got beat by records. At home. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, I like it. I, I like that idea. And I think Nebraska, like I'm looking at their schedule too. The only game I really don't think – like, not don't think, like Nebraska, Colorado in Nebraska week two, that's going to be a big game for Nebraska. But other than that, Northern Iowa, UTEP, Illinois, Purdue, Rutgers, they should take care of business. So at worst, I really see Nebraska being five and one heading into that Gosh, game. I imagine if it was two unbeaten teams, Indiana, and yeah. Nebraska. And it's kind of been, that's kind of been a weird, I don't want to call it a rivalry. I've kind of said it tongue in cheek in the past, just because you had the game where Indiana went to Lincoln and I believe it was Wap Fillier who had the the Chucky doll in the locker yeah. room, mm-hmm. and that was also at the time whenever it was it was Fred Glass, the athletic director for Indiana at the time, who was I guess going back and forth making comments along with Nebraska's athletic director, just kind of or no, it was with Scott Frost, their their previous head coach, mm-hmm. who had made a comment about how they wish they got scheduled with Indiana or Purdue more often because obviously with the the two divisions and that type yeah. of stuff and the crossover games. Yeah. So that was kind of fun to see Indiana get that that road win back then and kind of create that. Again, it's not a rivalry, of course, but yeah. there was a rivalry aspect to it at the time, and it yeah. could be revamped whenever they come to town this year. I don't know, John. I'm I'm all bought in now that you mentioned that that theor- that theor- <laughs> theoretical six and zero matchup. But I think that would be huge. A lot of lot of key visitors, Indiana basketball wise, on campus that weekend too. You imagine if they actually saw what a uh, peak, you know, Memorial Stadium could be like. I think that'd be pretty cool. So that would be, yeah. I mean, we'd probably see uh, quite a few uh, commitments after Tyler. We probably <laughs> have uh, a decent amount of uh, emergency podcasts to do after uh, that would happen. Yeah. I'm gonna plead the fifth on that one. No comment. <laughs> All right, moving forward to the, I guess, the Big Ten Conference as a whole. I mean. You know, big additions, Washington, Oregon, USC, UCLA. John, I'm going to start with you. Who do you kind of see as the – who do you think wins the Big Ten this year? Uh, This is probably – probably, in my opinion, it comes down to either Ohio State or Oregon. And I'm going to go with Ohio State simply because I do think over the course of the season, you're going to see maybe – I don't want to call it jet lag, but maybe just more like fatigue from having to travel so much from those West Coast teams. And I think with that – you're going to see teams like Oregon, even though they're super talented, you're going to see them take maybe an extra slip up or two that they wouldn't have necessarily had if they were still playing in the Pac-12. So I don't think you're going to see the West Coast teams dominate in any way, shape, or form. I mean, maybe Oregon does have a wonderful year and win the Big Ten, but I don't see a scenario where it's not Ohio State, so that's who I'm going with. I'm so glad that you picked Ohio State because I am I'm completely disagreeing with you. Okay. Equally on all this, but I'm going with Oregon um yeah. on this. Um a lot of talk, obviously, when you, you think of the Big Ten fans, um, the Midwest area and all those people, you think, oh, I mean, how are these West Coast teams gonna adapt to us? Blah, 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 especially when you look in the football, um, random things. So I think it's a little bit different. I, I think it's how are we how is the Big Ten? How's the Midwest? How are they going to adapt to these West Coast teams? And I think Oregon's going to come in, take advantage of, you know, that high-powered offense that Dan Lanning has. Um, he's he's arguably the best coach right now in college football. A um, lot of talent on that team. Very dynamic, high-powered offense, like I mentioned. And then they also have one of the best, better QBs in the conference and Dylan Gabriel yeah. transferred from Oklahoma. So I think he's going to be in there, and he could honestly be the quarterback of the league. Um Next year, he's easily a Heisman candidate as well. So, for me, it just makes all the sense in the world. Um, when something kind of crazy like this happens, kind of weird and unique happens where, you know, you look at a conference gets shooken up or whatever, it's usually a team that, you know, not expecting a whole lot from um, to come in and just kind of take over. And I think that's what Oregon's going to do. I, I think yeah. they're just going to run through the Big Ten this year. Yeah. John, I agree. I think it's between Oregon and Ohio State. I was really back and forth because that Ohio State defense is special. Caleb Downs, an incredible addition to that defense. But 
I lean Oregon. I, a lot of the reasons Kyler said Dylan Gabriel, I think he's the Heisman favorite for a reason. He's super talented. And not just Dylan Gabriel. They also returned Tez Johnson from last year, 1,100 yards, 10 touchdowns. Uh, their second leading rusher, Jordan James, who had 891 total yards, 12 touchdowns, averaged over seven yards a carry. I think when you look at the schedules, too, between Oregon and Ohio State, I think that also kind of plays a factor for me. I see a better chance of Oregon getting in. I think they both are going to end up in that Big Ten title game, but I think Oregon has an easier path when you look at their schedule. Their toughest games are Ohio State at home and at Michigan, while Ohio State has to go to Penn State, has to go to Happy Valley, uh, host Michigan, and is host Iowa, and then also goes to Oregon. And I think that October 12th game, it's going to be very telling. I don't know if you guys have uh, kind of seen the Twitter debate going on about weddings in the October 12th. Yes. <laughs> yes. We're going to talk uh, about that on Friday on my podcast. <laughs> there you go. Preview. Um, yeah, we'll preview. I, I think not – sorry to cut you off, Drew, but I, I think also uh, it's worth noting, given a few honorable mentions who also could probably win the Big Ten. Obviously, Michigan, they're still going to be pretty good. Scandals aside, they're going to still be pretty good. I think this Penn State team is going to be pretty solid as well. Um, USC, I think they're going to, you know, obviously have some fits, you know, um, in the Big Ten. So there's a lot of teams in that, you know, five to six range that I, I think could make a case for winning it. But I, I, we, we all three agree, Oregon and Ohio State, they're the top dogs this year. Yeah, definitely. I think it's – I mean, you mentioned it. There's a lot of talent in the Big Ten. And it's going to be – it's really interesting, though, just because no longer the East-West, where it's going to be, you know – in the past it was always Michigan or Ohio State. And then I think Michigan State slipped in one year, Penn State. So it was like, who's going to play that team and beat the team from the West versus this year? It's now you kind of finally get to see the two best teams in the conference at the top each year, which is something I think has been long overdue. And I think Indiana fans have been waiting for, especially now that you don't have to play Ohio State, Michigan every single year and Penn State like you have in years past. Moving to a, I guess, more national level, I'm going to go Heisman winner before national champion. So uh, keep uh, keep the people, make them wait a little longer. So, Kyler, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> I, Who do you have as your Heisman winner for 2024? And I have no stats to back this up. I mean, I, I honestly, I, I looked through a lot of, um, you know, the favorites here. I'm going to go Quinn Ewers from Texas um, okay. just because I feel like, I from what we've seen from him, um, he just screams Heisman to me. He really does. And honestly, I think Texas, it's always the running joke, Texas football's back. I do think they're back in a lot of ways, and I think they're trending upward really fast, and I think they're going to be one of the better teams um, in the uh, in the college level. So I'm going to go with Quinn Ewers as my uh, Heisman winner. For me, it's – I know traditionally, at least it feels like the, the Heisman has gone to – not only the best player, but it seems like it's the best team or the best player on the best yeah. team, if that makes sense. I know that wasn't really the case last year with Jaden Daniels, and I guess this might show a little bias. I do think it should have gone to Michael Penix. Yes. Um, but either way, without that goes without saying. Um, I think it's going to be Carson Beck from Georgia, and I'm strictly basing that off of I think Georgia's probably the best team in the country, and if they end up running the table like I yeah. think they might, uh, and you don't have any other clear-cut – I guess I mean, you will. We don't really know who they're going to be yet, uh, but I just think it's going to be in him for that reason solely. Yeah, I I mean, I was kind of going back and forth on a few guys. Carson Beck was a name. Dylan Gabriel is another guy. I think Carson Beck, I think there's just so much talent on that Georgia team. I think he's going to have – real. I don't know if he's going to have the crazy numbers that you, know, you see from a lot of these Heisman winners, but I don't think he's going to need to. I think he's going to take care of the ball and put up big numbers in addition to that. But I'm going a different direction. I'm going Jalen Milrow with Alabama. I think yeah. in that Kalen DeBoer offense, I mean, we saw what Michael Penix was able to do. I think Jalen Milrow has all the talent. Last year, he lost the starting job at one point, and then down the stretch, he turned Alabama into a contender. Alabama all year looked like this isn't the same Alabama of old. And then little, um, and then by the end of the year, they took down Michigan, who was probably the best team all season last year, down to the last play of the game. So. Jalen Milrow improved a lot last year. That Kalen DeBoer offense, I and mean, when you saw how how much firepower there is in Milrow with his ability to scramble, throw the ball deep, and really just extend plays with his feet, he's going to have some special moments this year. And if they're able to take down Georgia and win the SEC, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't be the Heisman there. No disrespect to Kalen DeBoer, but I just have this weird feeling that 
Alabama is going to take a step back this year. And I don't think that they're going to miss the playoff by any stretch of the imagination. And I do think Kalen DeBoer could have a lot of success and I may eat crow for this. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I just don't think they're going to be yeah. Nick Saban style Alabama and, and then they won't be. But what I mean by that is I just don't think they're going to be the clear cut best team. They're probably yeah. going to take, take a couple losses. You don't expect as DeBoer adjusts to being in the sec uh, but maybe I'm dead wrong about that. But that's just kind of how I see it playing out this year for them. No matter, you know, how talented of a coach and how great of a coach the board is, it's always going to be hard to replace a GOAT of any sport. Yeah. So yeah. it's going to be really, really hard to do so. But um, I'm kind of in agreement with you, John. I, I still think Alabama is going to be one of the top teams yeah. in the SEC. That's just without question. It's Alabama. Um, but they're not going to be national favorites, you know. Yeah. At least not maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we all maybe we're all just a bunch of dumbasses <laughs> and they're gonna take Kalen DeBoer's yeah. gonna take over college I mean, football because the dude's had the most meteoric rise, at least in my lifetime, that I've seen going up the coaching ranks. Yeah, yeah. No, he's great. I mean, his offenses are great, and we all saw how well Michael Penix did in it last year. Yeah. To think uh is an Indiana, you know, Indiana podcast, you have Kane Womack, the DC, former I <laughs> UDC, you have Nick Sheridan, another IU guy, and Kalen DeBoer, obviously an IU guy. This entire – the top three on this staff are all IU guys, and it's just really funny to say they all came under the Tom Allen tree, which the Tom Allen tree is at Bama. Think about that. And if they struggle, that's 100% what people are going to point to, is that he hired a staff that formerly coached at Indiana, even though they were successful at the time. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, love, I love it, though. The Tom Allen tree is one of the most underrated trees in college football. <laughs> it's so down. tiny. <laughs> well, well, that right now. I mean, soon – I mean – it's Alabama. If Kane Womack is a great defense, he'll get another. I mean, he left South. He was a head coach at South Alabama, left there to take the DC at Bama. He's going to, I mean, if they're successful, it's just the way it works. He's going to get a high major or a power four job. And same thing with Sheridan. And it's going to be really funny if Kalen DeBoer is great at Bama. In three, four years from now, we're talking about Nick Sheridan, Kane Womack, and Kalen DeBoer, all three leading power four programs. Well, Tom Allen is out of the, or I guess not a head coach. So that's, uh, oh, well, we'll see. I think if, if Tom Allen does well at Penn State, he'll eventually yeah. land another head coaching job somewhere if he wants it. But, but one thing about Nick Sheridan, he's going to kind of get to enjoy being the OC and not have mm-hmm. to do any of the play calling that he had to do whenever he was uh, under yeah. Tom Allen. Because Kalen DeBoer is going to be doing that. It's going to be yeah. his vision the way that it was like when he was at Indiana. And he'll, Nick Sheridan will get a job more than likely down the road if Alabama yeah. is successful. But I don't really think a lot of their success is going to be based on Nick Sheridan because, I mean, yeah. quite frankly, he was – I mean, he wasn't the worst at Indiana, but he certainly didn't live up to, I guess, kind of the, what, what he was billed as to be. So, But, hey, maybe I'll eat crow on that too. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things. You really never know. I mean, he – his. I guess, what was it, 2020, he was – I mean, they were great. The offense, despite poor line play, but a lot of that, you look at Michael Penix. And then 2021, Sheridan's last year at the program, really – I mean, no secret, they won three games. They took a huge step back. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess it's going to be really funny just to watch moving forward. And I do think you mentioned Tom Allen at Penn State. I think it was sneakily one of the biggest additions in the Big Ten this season. I think Tom Allen, I mean, he's always been a really good defensive coach. Indiana, even in the years they've struggled, they've been solid defensively. So I think Penn State has kind of needed that more consistency. And I really, I'm actually really excited to watch Penn State this year and kind of see how Tom Allen is like able to influence that defense. And I'm glad Indiana doesn't have to play them either. Yes, that would have been a little revenge game. I would not want to have to watch because I don't think it would have been pretty, especially <laughs> after the Hoosiers almost upset them last year too. So a little double-edged sword there, but. Kyler, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we mentioned uh, some of the best teams already, but who do you think is going to win the national title then? Pretty yeah. easy. Georgia, three straight. <laughs> They're the top. They are the dogs uh, for a reason. So, um, yeah, Georgia. Um, and I got no other, you know, anything else <laughs> that I like Georgia. You know, so I mentioned earlier, I do think Georgia is – Obviously, they're going to be the best team out of the gate. They're preseason number one, and I believe both the AP and the coaches poll. But one thing that's going to be interesting to see is how the new dynamic of the 12 team playoff yeah. kind of shapes things up. You know, who are they going to end up having to face, you know, depending on what seed they get? Um, so it's tough. If I'm just, I don't know, this, this feels like kind of a double question. It's almost like who's the best team versus who do you think will do well in the new playoff format? 
Um, and I do think I'm going to stick with who I said is going to win the Big Ten. I think it's going to be Ohio State. And I do think they're going to kind of be kind of on that same level as Georgia. But in a in a playoff scenario, Georgia, they're not, they don't have the hunger for a national title the way that Ohio State probably does yeah. with the disappointment they've had. And I do think, let's just say you get that Ohio State Georgia matchup, and it really is a battle of two juggernauts. I'd give the edge to Ohio State simply because I think they might want it more. And that might be a lame answer. Yeah. But if you're already coming off back to back titles, you may have guys on that team who maybe it doesn't mean as much to them because it's old hat for them again. I'm, this is just all the way I think about this type of stuff because Ohio State will definitely, yeah. as a whole, want that title more if it were to come down to one of those two teams. Before also, a little revenge you, game uh, if they play each other. Well, uh, the New Year's kick, I don't know if you guys remember that a couple years ago. Yeah. One of the worst kicks to win a game right at New Year's. <laughs> Ohio State had a yeah. chance to send Georgia home. <laughs> so a little hunger, but uh, Kyler, I guess, yeah. sort of you. Yeah, yeah. Before you go, Drew, sorry to cut you off. I mean – John made a point, you know, obviously maybe Georgia don't have that hunger or whatever and stuff. I'm going to say my opinion to win three straight national championship. That's that puts you at an elite. There is. Category. Yeah. That's something that doesn't happen. I'll give that, you that. That puts you in an elite category. So it'd be one thing if they were, if this was going for their back to back, you know, their second straight championship, that'd be one thing. I'd probably agree with you just a little bit there, but now that they've got the taste of, you know, two championships right in a row, three straight. I mean, that, that just puts you at a level, you know, that very few have seen. Hold on, Kyler. I, I want to clarify something right now. Yeah. Are we ignoring – so are we saying Michigan with the allegations, no national title? Is that what you're saying right now? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm saying. I wanted to clarify because I heard <laughs> you mention it earlier and I wanted to, you know, go back. To yeah, you guys – I just sat there. You you, uh, you had me thinking – I wasn't even thinking oh, about what? Michigan being the current title holders. They oh, are that's the right. dumbasses. Yeah. Yeah, they are yeah, back-to-back. Yeah. Back. That, that they is, sound yeah. like a bunch of fools right now. I was like – I, I didn't do my research, so – um, we could have just gone with it. We should just play with it like we're not acknowledging Michigan's national title. I, I mean, you could have just gone with it and been like, yeah, you know, the cheating allegations, you know, I'm not counting it. Uh, like Louisville 2013 college basketball, but like, yeah, it doesn't count. Well, I'll, I'll, how about this? You know, obviously Georgia's won, what, uh, two under smart, right? Um, two out of three, we can just say in a row, yes. I guess, if we want yeah. to be. Still, three championships, I still put you in an elite category. So we'll go ahead and yeah. just say that. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll kind of rescue myself there. But sorry, while we're Drew, talking Michigan, though, I think – I don't think they're going to be bad, but no, I, I think know. you're going to they're, they're not going to be Jim Harbaugh, Michigan. They're not going to be con really. We can call it Connor Stallions, Michigan, Michigan, if you want to. <laughs> um, I don't think they're going to be anywhere close to that Ohio State, Oregon tier. And really, if we're talking about if we're going back to Indiana, I guess, for a second, I think that could be depending on the type of season that Indiana is having, potentially another one of those winnable games that if, if they're having kind of. I don't want to call it a miracle season, but that if they're doing better than expected, I mean, that could be the the game that takes you to maybe nine wins, if we're being yeah. honest with ourselves, you know? Or maybe I'm just getting overhyped because that's literally, <laughs> I feel like all I've been doing this entire show is getting excited about Indiana football. I think, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with Michigan. I don't think they're going to be bad. I just think when you look at the Big Ten, I think it's one, two, and then, you know, it's Oregon, Ohio State whoever you have higher but and then a big drop off i think michigan could easily knock off either one of those teams i mean it's michigan they're gonna have a really really good defense i think will howard on or not will howard uh will johnson cornerback i think he's the best player in college football but i again it's a position where i don't think they're you know you can impact games just not the level of a quarterback or you know an edge rusher so i think michigan it's one of those things they could you know be a little dangerous but I'm going to go with her in the national title pick. I've been back and forth between Oregon and uh, Georgia. I keep going back and forth. I think Georgia's the better team, the more talent. But all the off-the-field stuff that's been happening this offseason, I'm wondering, is that going to play into it? Distractions, what could come of that? So I'm just going to go with Oregon. I think Dylan Gabriel and Carson Beck, I, it's a toss-up for me, but I lean Gabriel. And I just think that offense is so explosive. I love Dan Lanning and everything he says and everything he stands for. I think he's one of the most fun electric coaches in college football. And I think the way they lost last year when they knew they were on the precipice of getting into the playoff and came up just short, I think they're going to have that memory in their head and they're going to bounce back. Kyler, do you got something? I don't mean to. I don't no, 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 no. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. I, I was wanting to go back to Michigan for a second. And here's the thing. I, I think Sharon Moore's a bum or going to be a bum. So here's the thing. He might be fine. He'll he'll do – you're at Michigan. You can't do horrible, especially you, you were on a staff that won a national title. But I think down the road, he's not the answer for Michigan. He may do fine in his first year or two, 
but he's not going to have that same kind of power, if you will, that Jim Harbaugh had about him. Whereas if he doesn't have the same success, which I don't think he will, let's just say Michigan goes nine and three. That'll be a disappointment for Michigan. It may, it's a good record, but that's already a step back, at least when in the grand scheme of things. And they'll, especially if they, if they go back to their losing ways of Ohio state, especially now that they can't cheat with, with Connor Stallions and all that type of stuff. If Ohio state gets that mojo back, like I think they will, I think, You'll see Sharon Moore have a few decent seasons, but once you get to maybe year three or four, maybe he has like a seven and five and Michigan fans are just kind of a little pissed off about that. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I feel about how I feel about Michigan and where that thing's going to head under Sharon Moore. I don't think he's going to be a very good coach. Yeah, I think, I mean, we're going to find out right away with Michigan, Texas week two, they Texas yeah. comes to the big house. I think that's, I mean, that's going to be one of the more telling games in college football. You're going to get to see that Texas offense against that one of the best defenses in the country. I think Michigan, I think we can all agree. I mean, I think a lot of the questions when you look at that team, it's on the offensive side of the football. I think they have so much talent on defense that I see them take, they might take a slight step back, but I still think they're going to have one of the best defenses in college football, but I don't know if it's going to be enough. Alex Orgy, I think I said that right. I hope I said that right. But it's an Orgy? What a name, if that's his name. <laughs> it's, yeah, I think that's, I'm trying to, yeah, I think, yeah, Alex Orgy, I think that's how you spell it. <laughs> O-R-J-I, but yeah, either way, I mean, I like, you hear a lot of good things about him, but it's like you haven't seen him play. I think he has thrown one pass for five yards in his entire career with Michigan. You know, they, behind J.J., he wasn't going to see much action. So it's going to be something that's really interesting to watch, especially in year one with Sharon Moore. I mean, they have a tough schedule. They always have a tough schedule, but you have Oregon, USD, Texas, Ohio State. They could easily end up 8-4, and four, but if you take care of that, you know, go 10-2, and two, Maybe they missed out on the Big Ten title game. Is ten and two good enough to sneak into the playoff now with twelve teams? Could be. Oh yeah, it definitely. could be yeah. definitely. Um, all I know is that Indiana football would kill to have a ten and two record this year. Oh yeah, <laughs> which is crazy. They would have been. Wouldn't they have been the twelfth team in a twelve team playoff yep. in twenty twenty? Oh yeah, they yeah. definitely would have been. I believe they were right they number twelve, weren't they? I could be wrong about that. They were right there. I know that. There's so. another moral yeah. victory, were, yeah, for Indiana for that. For that, right? We take season. those. We take those. I could have totally seen the committee though moving the gold po goal posts like the Big Ten did, you know, with uh, get Ohio State <laughs> in the Big Ten championship and like they did last year with Florida State. Like, yeah, Tuttle. I I don't think I mean we all watched that bowl game against Ole Miss when uh Watt Fillier, what was it, 18 catches for 82 yards. One of the most astounding stat lines I think I've ever seen from a wide receiver, just showing how much Indiana couldn't throw the ball downfield. Just yeah. Yeah, you you're, you're on point, man. But yeah, I guess anything else you guys want? I guess one thing I do want to ask you guys real quick before we wrap up about the playoff. You guys, so like with the way it's organized, do you think the committee is going to put more of a focus on the best twelve teams in order, or are they going to try to avoid it so conferences aren't playing? So you don't have an Oregon and Ohio State playing each other before the national title. I think it really just depends. Um, you could probably, I mean, this is pretty comparable not really comparable, but kind of comparable to the NCAA basketball tournament um, in a lot of ways. I mean, it's really just going to depend on what the committee sees. I think um, it's definitely going to be a unique challenge for them this year yeah. in a lot of ways, to, you know, put the 12 best teams in there and whatnot. Um, we see it every, you know, towards the end of the seasons, um, every single college football year when they start releasing the college football playoff, um, you know, who's in the playoffs at this point in time when it was just four teams. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of, you know, switching up um, yeah. when it gets to that point when they start releasing those weekly and whatnot. But um, I'm curious to see, you know, what what teams that, you know, don't come from the power, you know, four conferences or whatever, what teams can sneak into that as well. So um, it's going to be awesome. I think it's great for the sport. Um, and I'm really excited for that. There's finally 12 teams in there and yeah. um, everyone's got the same record moving into there. I'm with you on that. And one of the thing I want to add to it is that I think when you see those last couple of spots and they're trying to decide which team is worthy and maybe you've got a couple of uh, – sorry, I, I need to stop looking at this chat because sometimes <laughs> I look at it in the corner of my eye. I'm just going to go to a my different fault. tab. I'll, yeah, no, that's my, I, I, it's all good. It's just not something I'm used to. I just need to not look at it. Um, but whenever it comes to brands and who you're going to leave in and out of the playoff, I think more often than not you're going to see – if, if it's super close, you're going to see them go with who the better ratings draw will be for those those last couple of spots for the playoff. I hate that that's the way that it goes, but 
after all, it is it is the entertainment business, as Kurt Signetti yeah. has told us multiple times. Yeah, it'll be. I guess it's going to be really fascinating to watch in the first year of the twelve team playoff. It's going to be a lot more, a lot of interesting because you never know. You know, we could see some, maybe not a Cinderella because it's only twelve teams. Yeah. But one of those teams that's around 10, 11, that gets hot at the end of the year, but lost a couple games early, they could sneak in versus in years past where they wouldn't have and could cause some damage. But as always, uh, for all things IU athletics, follow Indiana underscore FRN on Twitter, Facebook, and check out the HoosierIllustrated.com website and make sure to subscribe on YouTube. Hoosier Illustrated is also partnered with Tom Brady's company Autograph to streamline our coverage so you can do what you do best, follow IU sports. Use the code IndianaFR to get started today. As always, thank you for tuning in to the Talking About the Hoosiers podcast. We'll be back soon.